Hello everyone, and welcome to the Russian Empire History Podcast, the history of all the peoples of the Russian Empire. I'm your host, J.P. Bristow. This is Season 1, The Forest, The Steppe, and the Birth of the Russian Empire. And episode 28, Oleg the Seer and Igor Rurikovich. In this episode, we're going to be looking at Rurik's successors. Oleg, a kinsman of unspecified relationship, according to the Chronicles, and Igor, his son. So let's start with what the tale of bygone years tells us about Oleg, or Oleg, however he pronounced it. This is mainly going to be about conquering Rus. On his deathbed, it says, Rurik bequeathed his realm to his kinsman Oleg, and entrusted into Oleg's hands his very young son, Igor. A few years later, the chronicle gives the date of 880-882, Oleg sets out on a campaign with warriors from among the Varangians, the Chudes, the Slavs, the Mirians, and for some reason, all the Krivichians. He captures Smolensk and installs a garrison. He does the same at Lubich, a town around 200 kilometers north of Kiev. He continues on to Kiev, where he finds Asgold and Deer lording it over the town. Oleg sets an ambush for them. He hides his soldiers, approaches Kiev with Igor, and sends a message claiming that he's a stranger on his way to Greece for Oleg and Igor asking them to come out and greet a fellow Scandinavian. Asgord and Deer turn up. Oleg's soldiers jump out and seize them. Oleg condemns them for taking over the rule of Kiev. You are not princes, nor even of princely stock, but I am of princely birth. He then displays Igor and announces that he is the son of Rurik. Asgord and Deer are executed and buried. Oleg takes over Kiev and declares that it, it is the mother of Rus cities. The tale of bygone years then tells us that the Varangian Slavs and others accompanying him were called Rus. He begins building forts and imposes tribute on the Slavs, Krivichians, and Mirians. In the following campaign season, he conquers the Drevlians and imposes a tribute of black martin skins. The year after that, he conquers the Siverians and imposes a light tribute on them, and tells them that they should no longer pay tribute to the Khazars. By this point, it appears that the Rus have become sufficiently powerful that he only needs to send the Radimichians a message asking them who they paid tribute to, and when they say the Khazars, he tells them, well, you can pay me now. He also goes to war with the Uluchians and the Tivirtians. After this, there's a fairly long digression where the tale describes the migration of the Magyars and Cyril and Methodius bringing literacy to the Slavs. And when we get back to the Rus, Igor is already grown up and gets married to a wife named Olga from Skolf. Oleg then leaves Igor in Kiev, and gathering a multitude of Varangians, Slavs, Chudes, Krivichians, Mirians, Polyanians, Severians, Derevlians, Redimichians, Croats, Dulebians, and Tiversians, sets off to attack Constantinople. The attack is successful, and the Byzantines are forced to agree to peace, with the payment of a large sum to the Rus and the granting of favourable trading terms. Upon his return to Kiev, Oleg is greeted as Oleg Vyeshi, Oleg the Seer, Prophet or Sage, which the tale says is because the people were pagans and therefore ignorant. The following year, a comet appears, and Oleg sends his representatives to conclude a treaty between the Rus and the Greeks, which is provided verbatim in the text. The chronicler states, Thus Oleg ruled in Kiev and dwelt in peace with all nations. Which does not quite seem to match what we've been hearing, but never mind. Now we get one of those classic 
doom foretold stories. Oleg has a fine horse that he has never ridden. He asks his magicians how he will die. One says that the steed he loves and rides will cause his death. Oleg decides never to ride the horse and commands that it be looked after but never brought into his presence. The years pass and one day he remembers the horse. Inquiring after it, he is told that it has died. Oleg laughs and declares, Soothsayers tell untruths, and their words are naught but falsehood. The horse is dead, but I am still alive. He commands his horse be saddled, and rides out to where the horse's bones lay. Laughing, he says, So I was supposed to receive my death from this skull, and stamps on it. A snake crawls out of the skull, bites his foot, and he dies. He's buried in Kiev after reigning for 33 years. So that is Oleg. Let's take a quick look at what we have here. Rurik obviously was the beginning, starting the Rus in Stara Ladoga and Novgorod, and we know that fits with the factual evidence that we have for early Rus, even if we don't have direct evidence concerning Rurik himself. The Rus did indeed come from Scandinavia, and they did indeed establish themselves in that area first. With Alek, we then see them move south. They are a multi-ethnic bunch, with Scandinavians, Balts, Finnogrians, and Slavs. They are in a rivalry with the Khazars. We see them taking the Khazars' tributaries away from them, and there will be more to follow. This is actually the only rivalry of this kind with a neighboring power that we have in the Chronicles. It's rather vague, and scholars see it as an echo of an oral tradition or folk memory of the time when the Khazars had been overlords of the Western Steppe and the Slavs. But by the time the tale of bygone years was written down, the Khazars no longer existed. They are trying to enter into relations with Byzantium. Again, this matches what we know happened, although if you're paying attention to those dates, you might see that they don't quite line up with the evidence that we've discussed so far. This might be down to the kind of assumptions a monk based in Kiev writing 200 years later might make, taking Kiev as more important at that time because it was later on. Or, by the other reasons. We could see a continued attempt to legitimate the Rurikid dynasty. Oleg is described as a kinsman of Rurik and is opposed to Asgold and Deer, who are quite pointedly not of princely stock, and therefore have no business setting themselves up as the rulers of Kiev. Asgold and Deer fail to discharge the task Rurik had assigned to them of opening relations with Constantinople, while Oleg successfully attacks it and obtains a favorable trade agreement. The people recognize his wisdom and success, and they give him the name of Oleg the Seer. The comment from the chronicler that they did this out of ignorance is probably not intended to be derogatory to Oleg as such, but rather to fit into a narrative that Rus' success was actually God preparing the way for the future Rus, champion of Christianity. Oleg is also depicted as taking Rurik's actual son, Igor, around with him, and as only ruling because Igor is extremely young. Does that whole thing seem a little ambiguous to you? Is Oleg a king or some kind of regent? Well, if you recall from the last episode, we do have some inconsistencies among the versions of the Chronicles. The chroniclers are trying clearly to grapple with the problem that they have created a dynasty with a founding father, and then Oleg doesn't seem to be part of that dynasty. The Novgorodian first chronicle says that he was actually the commander of the army, not the Knyaz. Those textual analyses we were talking about last time show that the Laurentian chronicle that I quoted the one we're calling the Tale of Bogon Years, and the Novgorodian First Chronicle, are both based on a common earlier chronicle. 
And the version of the story in the Novgorodian Chronicle is the earlier version of the story. Case closed. Oleg was not king of the Rus. Not so fast. Unfortunately, we also have the treaty he signed with the Byzantines, which clearly shows that he was the king. We're on pretty solid ground with the attack on Constantinople, which we have already discussed in previous episodes, and we have confirming records from the Byzantines, although once again the dating is a bit inconsistent. And then we get some typical medieval storytelling with prophecies, fatal snakes. Overall, I think we can agree that it seems like a fairly straightforward and reasonable story, and the first question that's going to come up for us is, did Oleg exist? It's a good question, and we're going to go back over those dates and see what we can make from it. But before we do that, let's take a look at what the Chronicle says about Igor. And then when we get to the analysis, you're going to see why I'm doing them both together. So, we've already heard that Igor had grown up and married Olga. And for 913, the tale states... Igor succeeded Oleg and began his reign. It then adds that the Derevlians resisted Igor after Oleg's death. Igor attacks and conquers the Derevlians and makes them pay more tribute than Oleg had. In 915, the Pechenegs enter Rus for the first time, but make peace with Igor and move on towards the Danube. There are some entries on the Bulgarians, Pechenegs, and Magyars fighting with Byzantium. And after 20 years of these digressions, in 941, we return to Igor. The Rus set out in 10,000 boats. They ravage the Pontus, commit various atrocities, burn churches, monasteries, and villages, and generally loot the place. The Byzantine army, 40,000 men led by Pantherius the Domestic, arrive and defeat the Rus in a difficult land battle. The Rus board their ships at night to flee, but run into the Byzantine navy and are terrified of the devastating Greek fire. They return home and Igor sends messengers to recruit an army of Varangians. Gathering another large army of Varangians, Rus, Polyanians, Slavs, Kravitians, Tiverzians, and Pechenegs, Igor sets off again, the tale says, by ship and by horse, seeking revenge. As they approach, the emperor hears that they are coming and sends emissaries to negotiate. Igor's comitatus says, why risk the fight if the Byzantines are willing to give them all the gold and silver they want anyway? So Igor takes his gold and silver, and he sends the Pechenegs off to ravage the Bulgarians, and goes home to Kiev. Here we get another treaty with the Byzantines, and a list of the Rus envoys. Listen to some of these names. Verfast, Isgout, Slothy, Olif, Kenitsa, Sigbjorn, Grimm, Harkon, Kari, Freystein, Althulf, and my personal favourite, kill the representative of Clacky. That's not all of them, but I think you can see they're all pretty Norse-sounding. No Slavic names yet. With his treaty with Constantinople settled, Igor turns his mind once more to milking the Derevlians. The man he put in charge of them, Sveinald, is apparently doing very well out of the position, and Igor's retinue are complaining that the exacted tribute isn't ending up in their pockets. Igor raids the Derevlians and gathers his tribute. On his way home, he decides he wants even more. He sends most of his men on, carrying the tribute, and turns back with a few to shake down the Slavs once again. The Derevlians go to their prince, Mal, and say, if we do not kill him now, he will destroy us all. They send a message to Igor, asking him why he is coming, since he already gathered their tribute. Igor ignores him, and 
the Derevlians ambush him, kill him and all his companions. So ends Igor, after ruling for the same 33 years as Oleg. What a remarkable coincidence. Where have I seen that number 33 before? As with Oleg, the general outline of the story superficially seems quite plausible. Igor is consolidating the Rus' position in Kiev, dealing with the newly arrived Pechenegs, and continuing to try to use force of arms to obtain a favourable position in Constantinople. But that 33-year reign, immediately after the preceding 33-year reign, seems a bit suspicious, right? Actually, if we look closer, Igor succeeds in 913, attacks the Derevlians in 915, and then all the next entries are about things happening outside of Rus for the next 20 years. That looks a bit off too, especially as we then go right back to Igor dealing with the Derevlians again. So our superficially plausible narrative actually throws up a couple of problems. One, what was actually going on with Oleg the not Rurik son and Igor Rurik's son? And two, what's up with that timeline? So let's have a look at some of the evidence we have for Oleg and Igor and see if we can figure out what's going on. We do have some evidence for a leader called Oleg, or rather the Norse form of the name, Helgi. References to a person called Helgu, Helgo, are found in a few texts, which could be a reference to a Helgi and therefore to an Oleg, but the historicity of this person is difficult to determine from the documents, and the question still remains of whether this Oleg is the same Oleg as in the Chronicle. As an example, one of these texts is a letter from the Genizar of Cairo, written by an anonymous author who presents himself as a subject of Joseph, the Khan of the Khazars, during the attack on Constantinople that the tale of bygone years says was led by Igor in 941. The letter says that the king of the Rus was Helgi, who, according to the tale, had already been dead for 30 years at that point. As the author of the letter was a contemporary of the events, his account cannot simply be dismissed. We should also probably note that the date the Chronicle gives for the raid on Constantinople is different from the date in the Byzantine records, which we can take as fairly reliable. So if we allow for now that the Chronicle's dates are off, what can we reconstruct about this Helgi? Using the letter from the Genizar and the reply of King Joseph, which we've already mentioned back in the episodes on the Khazars, we can put together one story. Joseph describes some of the conflict between the Khazars and the Byzantines after the Khazars convert to Judaism. Following a round of Khazar reprisals against Christians, the Byzantines give gifts to someone Joseph calls Helgo, King of Russia, to persuade him to attack the Khazar city, the tale of bygone years calls Tumultura Khan, which a thousand years previously had been the ancient Greek city of Phanagoria on the east side of the Kerch Strait. The reason for the Byzantines picking the Rus is given as the earlier raid we've already mentioned a couple of times, the one where the Rus raided the Caspian with the Khazar's approval, and were then slaughtered by the Muslim subjects of the Khan on their way home. This is said to have ruined relations between the Rus and the Khazars, and so the result is this new campaign at the behest of Constantinople. And it's worth noting that Joseph is writing about these events about five years later, so it's reasonable to assume that he knows what he's talking about. There is an initial phase of minor clashes for which Joseph is our sole source, 
And then a large-scale campaign that is also recorded in Byzantine sources and mentioned in Western European and Islamic sources. Helvi arrives at the Taman Peninsula by boat while the Khazar commander was away and takes Tmutorakan by stealth. The Khazar official governing Kerch, on the other side of the strait, could not immediately tackle the Rus because they came by boat and the Khazars have no fleet. So instead he attacks the Byzantine towns in Crimea and puts Kherson under siege. There's a section of the letter in poor condition, but it can be reconstructed to say that the Khazars recovered their captive compatriots, that is, those that the Rus had taken to sell into slavery, and executed the Rus in the city. The Khazars then fight Helgi and his men for four months, and recovering all of the loot that the Rus had taken, the Khazar commander gives Helgi an ultimatum, quote, Go and make war against Romanus, as you did fight against me, and I will leave you alone. But if not, I will either die or live until I shall work my revenge, end quote. Maybe he had some other form of persuasion to hand as well, but whatever the case, the Rus fought the Byzantines at sea for four months. To conclude the story, Joseph says that when the Rus were overwhelmed by the Greek fire, Helgi was ashamed to return to his home country, so he and his remaining men went to Persia by sea, but they soon perished. The pseudo Simeon an anonymous Byzantine writer, describes a Rus attack on Constantinople in the time of Romanus I. It lasted from June to September 941, so those four months again, and was crushed in two sea battles thanks to the use of Greek fire. A few years later, the attack is also reported by Lutprand of Cremona, a bishop who served the Holy Roman Empire as a diplomat to the Byzantines and wrote some noted works on history and politics. And in the life of St. Basil the Younger, a geography of a 10th century Byzantine monk that was written around the same time. We also have a couple of Muslim sources. Miskawe, a philosopher and historian from 10th century Persia, describes an invasion of the west coast of the Caspian, which was commonly called Persia, in 944 or 45. The Rus initially succeed in capturing the city of Badha, but got sick eating unfamiliar food. Many died from diarrhea, and others were killed by the Muslims, including their leader. I'm sure you immediately recognize that this account lines up rather well with the tale in Joseph's letter. This means we have the following state of affairs. The Rus chronicles say that Igor led the 941 attack on Constantinople and Alek was long dead at that point. Igor's involvement in the attack is confirmed by Byzantine records. Lutprand of Cremona mentions a king Inga, so Igor. The Khazars think that the king was Helgi, or Olek. You won't be surprised to learn that a multitude of theories have been put forward to get around these problems. Attempts have been made to derive Igor from Helgi rather than Ingvar, the Norse name it is usually agreed to come from. It's been argued that Helgi is just another Alec who was Igor's commander. In another version, it's claimed that Helgi did not actually attack Byzantium, but only raided some Byzantine possessions around the Black Sea. Just a minor incursion, not the 941 invasion. And other scholars have resorted to the simple claim that the writers just mix the names up. But it is possible to reconstruct a narrative that is consistent with all the sources and resolves the timeline issues. So, going back to the Chronicles for a minute. We have the tale of bygone years from Kiev and the Novgorodian First Chronicle, which is, of course, from Novgorod. The tale contains the text of the treaties with Byzantium, but otherwise they're similar, and both derive from that preceding version that Shachmat have called the Nachalny's Lod, the initial compilation. 
If you accept this theory, the initial compilation was also a chronicle. That is, it presented events in a year-by-year -year format, rather than constructing a grand narrative. Some scholars also believe that the chronicles preserve evidence of another 11th century text. This one, a continuous narrative based on oral history, which has been called the Tale of the Russian Kings of the 10th century. There are no extant copies of this history, but the hypothesis is that when the chroniclers are creating their narrative, they are breaking up this tale to fit their purposes. So we've already referred to one difference between the texts. In the Novgorodian First Chronicle, Oleg is Igor's commander, while in the tale of bygone years, He's something of a king regent that Rurik appointed due to his true heir, Igor, being too young. As I already mentioned, we know Oleg was king because he made a treaty with Byzantium that shows he was. And it's not too difficult to see why this is problematic for the chroniclers. Oleg should not be king because he is not Rurik's heir, and therefore he does not have a legitimate dynastic claim. So the Novgorodian First Chronicle makes him just the commander. The tale of bygone years, on the other hand, incorporates the text of the Byzantine treaty, so the writer has to admit that he was king or changed the treaty, and therefore decides to make him a somewhat ambiguous mental figure to Igor. The two chronicles also give us different timelines. The Novgorod First Chronicle does not have the clearly invented 33 years plus 33 years reigns. It actually doesn't state the date for either appearing on the scene, but it does say that Oleg dies in 922. Igor then rules alone for 24 years. In the Novgorod First Chronicle, Igor begins his reign after Oleg has mysteriously disappeared following a raid on Constantinople. The chronicler does not know where he went or where he died. Following this, Igor, based in Kiev, goes to war against the Derevlians and the Ulichans. He conquers the Ulichans and gives their tribute to his general Svonald. He spends three years trying to capture the town of Perisechin, and then he also gives the tribute of the Derevlians to Svonald. This creates discontent among his men. Nothing happens for the next 17 years, rather like the intermission for the history of other people in the tale of bygone years. And then it picks up again. That year, the Ulichens surrendered and became tributary to Igor, and Perisherchen was captured. That same year, he gives their tribute to Sweno. It's deja vu all over again, and Igor's soldiers also pick up their complaint from 20 years previously, moaning about how much money Svinald and his men are making. Igor sets out against the Derevlians, extracts a second tribute, sends his men home, but gets greedy and returns to the Derevlians with a small force, which is destroyed, including murdering Igor. It does not seem like too much of a stretch to conclude that both chronicles have split a fairly short story to make it take up an extra 20 years. If we cut out this block where nothing happens in the Novgorod Chronicle and the tale of bygone years gives us a tour of the Pechenegs, Magyars and Bulgarians, it only improves the coherence of the story. <laughs> So, Igor begins his reign with a campaign against the Derevlians, who lived west of Kiev, and the Ulitans, who lived on the lower Dnieper. The Ulitans are swiftly overcome, and Igor allocates their tribute to his general, Svonal. One Derevlian town, Perisechen, unexpectedly puts up resistance for three years. The Derevlians attack twice, but rebel against the third attempt and kill Igor. Rather than 33 years or 24 years, this gives us a reign for Igor of 3 or 4 years. So if he died in 945, he took the crown in 941 or 942, which is exactly the time when the Genizar letter says that Oleg left Rus. 
So if we make the starting date of Eager's sole rule of verse 941, everything starts to fall into place. This is a timeline that was reconstructed by the historian Constantine Zuckerman in a 1995 article titled On the Date of the Khazars' Conversion to Judaism and the Chronology of the Kings of the Rus, Oleg and Igor, which is the main source that I'm drawing this discussion from. So let's return to the raid on Byzantium in 941. Pseudo Simeon and the life of St. Basil the Younger describe two battles, one, off Constantinople, and one off the shore of Asia Minor. Both the Novgorod First Chronicle and the Tale of Bygone Years drop the second battle and have the survivors flying for Kiev after the first one. Why? Ludbrand of Cremona describes the first battle and has Igor immediately fleeing after this defeat. That clearer? We have some kind of diarchy in Rus. Igor and Oleg jointly lead the raid south. Their forces are divided in the first battle, and after defeat, Igor flees back to Kiev. Oleg is driven off in the other direction with his men, and they continue fighting. Back in Kiev alone, Igor assumes sole control. Oleg learns from a messenger or otherwise through his contacts that there's now no place in Kiev for him to return to. As his men are gradually being stripped away by fighting around the coast of Byzantium, he decides to flee further to Persia, where he conquers the city of Barta, but loses most of his men to sickness. We've already heard the Arab source on this, and the same story is in the life of St. Basil. This also makes sense of the rest of Eagle's reign. Why is he handing over so much money to Sveinold? because he has taken over sole power where he previously reigned alongside the commander of the army, and he needs a new strongman supporter to secure his position. While Oleg's Rus are off in the Caspian, Igor concludes a new treaty with Byzantium. It's less favourable than Oleg's treaty from 911 because this raid was a failure. Questions have been raised about the relationship between the Rus and the Khazars. How could the Rus be switching from fighting the Khazars for Byzantium to fighting Byzantium for the Khazars? If they were enemies of the Khazars, how did Oleg get his ships to the Caspian, which would have required Khazar permission to cross their territory? If we allow for this split in the Rus forces that went south, the problem is resolved. It's the lost Rus who could not return home that aligned themselves with the Khazars. And in Miskawai's record of the attack on Bardha, it's made clear that this is not just a raid. He writes that the Rus declared, quote, There is no dispute between us on the matter of religion. We only desire sovereignty. It is our duty to treat you well and yours to be loyal to us. End quote. They'd arrived in Bardha as they arrived on the Dnieper, looking to take over and rule the local inhabitants to build a new home. They only turn to fighting and pillaging when an army arrives to drive them out. The chronicles are also confused over Oleg's death. The tale of bygone years says that he dies and is buried in Kiev. The Novgorod First Chronicle says that he is buried in Stara Ladrka, but also that others say he went beyond the sea and died there. That sounds like the Genizar letter again. He went to Persia by sea, and there he and all his troops fell. Miskawai gives us a fuller story. Helgi Orlik has taken Barta, and his men have been decimated by diarrhea. The army, led by Mazuban ibn Muhammad, has faced the Rus several times, but always lost. So they set a trap. The Rus charge in on foot except for their leader, who is riding a donkey. That would fit our timeline too, as Oleg would be quite old at this point, at least into his 60s. The trap is sprung, and Oleg and his 700 of his men are killed. So let's summarize our reconstructed timeline. Oleg becomes the ruler of the Rus in the north, probably in Novgorod, maybe in Gnozdova. He moves south in the 910s, 930s, not the 880s. Why? 
because it is around 910 that the Khazars Muslim subjects slaughter the Rus army, and this betrayal ends the amicable relations between the Khazars and the Rus, and sends the Rus down the Dnieper looking for new trading routes and partners, taking Kiev and securing the new treaty with Constantinople. If you remember from our End to the Rus episodes, the archaeological record shows a sudden explosion of Rus in Kiev right in the early 10th century, while there's no evidence of anything significant happening there in the 880s. The evidence also shows the trade with Byzantium developing after the Rus move into the Dnieper, not the other way around. Oleg and Igor have some kind of shared power system until the next campaign against the Byzantines, when Igor abandons Oleg, flees the battle with the Byzantines and takes sole power in Kiev. Oleg moves into the Caspian, tries to establish a new base, but dies. Igor is excessively greedy and is killed after just a short reign. You don't need to take this as 100% fact because obviously some parts are speculative, but it is a reconstructed timeline that adjusts the story in the tale of bygone years to match archaeological evidence and other contemporary written sources that were much closer to the events than the writer of the Rus Chronicles. So, if we ask, how did we end up with the story in the tale in the Novgorod First Chronicle, we get back to the questions of the chronicler's sources and purposes. The first thing we can note is that the tale of bygone years draws on the Byzantine sources, which we've already said, and there we have that first encounter with the Rus emissaries that get sent to Louis the Pious, and then we have the treaty signed with Igor. That period covers about 100 years, and so the chronicler has to fit the Rus oral tradition behind the chronicles into that space of a century that he has from the Byzantine records. The Rus tradition says that there were three kings, Rurik, Oleg, and Igor. So that near century has to be divided up between those three. The chronicler does not have the actual dates for their reigns, so he just makes it up and assigns them a symbolic number of years each. You'll remember that we don't have a name for the Rus Kayan who sent the emissaries to Byzantium, so there's no actual reason to assume that he was Rurik. And the timeline fits much better with the evidence if we move him and Oleg up uh, another 30 years or so. In addition, Oleg and Igor are clearly two problematic figures. Oleg, because he is not the heir of Rurik, but somehow becomes king, and Igor, because he is cowardly, backstabbing, greedy, seems to have difficulty controlling his men, and barely rules for any time at all. Looking back over the story we've been discussing today, I think you can't help concluding that Oleg was a much more successful king than Igor. He expanded Rus' territory, he managed Rus' relations with their tributaries much better, and he obtained a better trade treaty from Byzantium. So Oleg is turned into a regent or mentor figure, and Igor's reign is extended by inserting 20 years of nothing into the middle of his misadventures with the Derevlians. Oleg finds his place within the scheme of legitimizing the Rurikids, playing an entirely worthy role in consolidating the kingdom, while Igor gets boosted as much as a man of so few achievements can be. And his betrayal and murder by the Derevlians helps set the scene for someone who has a much, much more significant role to play in the chronicle's story of Rus. Join me next episode for the story of Igor's widow, the woman who will become Saint Olga of Kiev, equal to the Apostles. Thank you for listening. Until next time, goodbye. <laughs>